Hey, you just found the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast on YouTube. This is Mind Pump. Okay, we got a giveaway for you today, like we do on all of our podcasts on this channel. Here's what you got to do to win a free MAPS Anabolic program. So you get access to MAPS Anabolic, one of my most popular workout programs. If you do the following, leave a comment in the first 24 hours below. And if Doug picks your comment, he will send you MAPS Anabolic for free. Uh, now, we had a lot of fun doing this podcast because uh, I talk about the book that I wrote that is out now for pre-order. By the way, you can go check it out or order it early with some cool giveaway stuff. Go to theresistancetrainingrevolution.com. One more thing before we start the podcast. Uh, turn on your notification, subscribe to this channel, and we have two workout programs on sale and a workout bundle on sale. Here's what they are. The first program is Maps Hit. The second program that's on sale is MAPS Split, and the bundle that's on sale is the Bikini Bundle. You can learn more at mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code SPRINGBREAK for 50% off. All right? Enjoy this podcast. Guess what? It's a big day, son. Oh, Woo. it's exciting. I know. It's exciting. I don't know if I'm more excited than you are or not. I feel like I am. Yeah, yeah. I'm hyped. Sal's like downplaying. Are you? I'm hyped, man. I'm hyped. Really? Yeah, yeah, It's yeah. kind of a big deal. It is. It's exciting. The the you know I've I've put you know words to paper and it's it's going to be out pre order as, as of the dropping of this podcast. You were published. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's cool. It's, it's pretty cool. A lot of people in our space, not knocking on anybody either, write books and they mm -hmm. self publish. Which hey, more power to you. But for someone to pay you to write a book. That's a big deal. Yeah, it's it's cool. It's it's a yeah. it's actually an honor. I'll be honest with you guys. It's, Justin it's, was really jealous about it for like months when he, we found out. So oh, angry, no, I was. He's, he's like, <laughs> oh man, yeah. You know, like, I, I have like five books. You know, they just need to ask. <laughs> yeah, they're just not nobody's asking me. Stupid. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I will say that uh, I'm uh, honored to be able to represent um, the team uh, with the book. That's a big big um, honor for me. In fact, that's what made me nervous to do it because uh, I, you know, I. Want to make you guys proud and do well for for you guys because of how much I, I well, respect we knew what I you guys do. We knew I couldn't do it. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't, can't spell. <laughs> I don't, you don't need to know how to spell anymore. Did you know that? No, really. Yeah, they have something called spell check now. I knew it. I should have wrote the book. <laughs> if you only yeah. knew. Yeah, really? that's cool. Yeah, but it take me four times as long for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, no, not really. Not really. So I, you know what? What's kind of cool about doing this episode is that uh, even though obviously we know about it. Um, there's a lot of the process that, you know, I don't know about, like you've really handled this on your own. I know you had a, you had an agent, right. Mm -hmm. That supported you. Our legal team supported you. We're all so busy doing different things that you've just kind of took that on your yeah. shoulders that you'll handle that side. Um, so I'm actually kind of excited to talk to you a little bit about what that process was like. Mm -hmm. Um, and let's start first with, um, why, why this title, why this book? Right. So, you know, I, when they approached us uh, to, you know, to, to put together something in writing in a book um, to, to help people, obviously it was going to be something with fitness and health. That's uh, my expertise. It's what I enjoy my passions about. I wanted to write about, uh, he, there's a problem with the, the, the health space at large. And the big problem is that the, the first line of exercise, right? The first recommendation that doctors and health practitioners, uh, maybe except for personal trainers, will make to people, regardless of what their goal is, whether it's weight loss or improving their health or getting better lipid numbers or their cholesterol or blood pressure, it's almost always never the most effective form of exercise for all of those things, which is resistance training. And this is a, a big problem. Uh, as trainers, we saw this all the time. We knew, we saw the power of properly applied Resistance training now, on what, improving your, all those things. What's your theory on why that is? And do you address that in the book? Like what? Why? I do. Oh, okay, you do. Yeah, I do. There's a lot of stereotypes uh, around resistance training. We have to go if we go back to exercise and activity in general. Exercise was was recognized as a way to improve your health a long time ago, but it really was uh, focused around just being active, right? Mm -hmm. uh, hiking or climbing or running or or playing sports. There wasn't really a structured structured forms of exercise aside from that. Resistance training was one of the newer forms of exercise that was kind of put together, even though 
different forms of resistance training have been practiced for thousands of years. We have evidence of dumbbells being used by the, the Greeks and the Romans, but still it really wasn't a form of exercise until uh, much later. And the people who popularized it at first were the extreme versions of people who did who lifted weights, which were bodybuilders, right? Mm -hmm. So and the, really, the, the the first time it really went mainstream. Well, if if you go back even further, actually, you go back to the fifties and sixties. Those Muscle Beach kind of B movies uh, were not super popular, but they were out there, right? With you know guys like Dave Draper uh, on the beach and these They're kind of muscle heads. sand on the wimps. Yeah, yeah. and in the, the stereotype there was the meathead, the dumb, whatever, with the big muscles. Then you had Pumping Iron that came out um, in the seventies with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and that was a documentary that went relatively mainstream, got kind of popular. So the people connected resistance training to bodybuilding, mm -hmm. uh, to looking like these extreme humans uh, with big, huge muscles. This right, it wasn't about health. It was about looking a certain it, way. It was, and so it developed a stereotype. Um, and till this day, this is something that you, you have to combat with resistance training, that mm -hmm. it's not just for, first of all, if you're training and building muscle, um, you are a bodybuilder, right? Not a competitive bodybuilder, but you are building your body. Actually, anytime you exercise to train your body in a way to get it to adapt in a favorable way to improve its health, you are building the body. But when we think of lifting weights still, and maybe not us, but to the average person, right? Go talk to your aunt or your uncle or someone who doesn't, who isn't a fitness fanatic. When they think of lifting weights or resistance training, they think of bodybuilders. Yeah. And so it has this stereotype that has prevented uh, so many people from literally of all the forms of exercise, and I get into this real deep in the book, mm -hmm. of all the forms of exercise that we can pick that will combat all of the problems that we're encountering, especially in modern times, one form of exercise is most is the most well suited to combat all of those things. By itself, resistance training is just the most effective. Yeah. Unfortunately, nobody it's nobody does it as the first form of exercise, and still it's one that's not even a mainstream form of exercise. Yeah, it's interesting to look back at sort of the timeline of what was popular, what was mainstream. Like if was it the sixties into the seventies where you started to see this big running uh initiative where like culture was all about getting out and then running and then and then you kind of move in towards like the eighties where it was all like this jazzercise, this aerobic mm -hmm. uh sort of effort where everybody thought that was the way that we're gonna stay in shape and be healthy. Yeah. So in fact, Justin, my inspiration for this book, the reason why I named it the Resistance Training Revolution was in the in the 70s, there was a book that was put out. In fact, if you saw the, the cover of this book, you'd probably recognize it. It's called The Complete Book of Running, and it's got like a lower leg and a running shoe. I thought it was called The Running Revolution. N no, no. Oh, it, wasn't? it started The Running Revolution. Uh, right? oh, the book, was, the book was called The Complete Book of Running. And when this book came out, it started this huge trend that we're still in even today of people running uh, for fitness. And it was it had a huge impact on, there it is right there. I mean, you, I know you guys have seen that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an iconic uh, book. And it got so many people to lace up some running shoes and go and run uh, to become fit. And so I said, you know, I would like to write a book that would do this for resistance training, uh, mainly because resistance training, the benefits you derive from it, everybody, uh, surpass any other form of exercise by itself. When you compete in head-to-head -head, uh, competition for any, actually any goal, and we can get into this, it's the best form of exercise. And so I'm like, I want to defeat the stereotype. I want the average person to, to, when they think to themselves, I need to get fit to think resistance training not other forms of exercise, which nothing necessarily wrong with them. They're just not nearly as effective. Now, how did they get the medical community, though, behind running as the main form of exercise? It couldn't have been because of this book. Is it because we just didn't have the technology that we have today to be able to measure a lot of the things that you get as far as the benefits from resistance training? The studies training? on resistance training for health were way behind. Yeah, minimal. Way behind, right? Yeah. The studies the we had- The Soviets had like a, a, a lot like further advanced than us. Yeah, the studies around resistance training really revolved around performance. They revolved around Olympic weightlifting and athletes. They didn't do a whole lot of studies on- Health. 
Yeah. How does it improve bone health? How does it balance out hormones? Interesting. Uh, how does it burn body fat? Like, do you know when that started to get more popular? We're, we're seeing a lot more stuff in, from the 90s uh, and then especially now and today. But now we're doing this bat, this fight. This this We're fighting the stereotype still. I mean, you guys know this. Um, and this is even worse for women. Women have suffered the most from this terrible stereotype. Uh, that, that surrounds resistance training. You know this. Till this day, this is still an, something you have to overcome mm -hmm. when you talk to the average woman whose fitness goals are whatever, lose weight, improve health, whatever. You have to almost talk her into lifting weights in a traditional way because her fear is that she's going to look you know, like a bodybuilder or like a man or bulky or whatever. The irony of that, though, is there's a part of me that was is kind of grateful for that. I mean, this is also what opened up the door or the opportunity for trainers to be able to teach that to that demographic, right? And and know that when I introduce this to her, she is going to see results. Like she's she's been running and dieting for the last ten years of her life, trying to get to this weight or this look, and she has no idea that I'm going to teach her. You know these exercises that she's—they're completely foreign to her. And I know from my experience that her body's going to morph and change rapidly, like she's never seen before. So yeah. there is a part of me that's like, I, I, you're frustrated as a, as a trainer. But look, because, I got this magic thing yeah. that you can it, do, right? That you know you knew you had that in your back pocket that you're going to be able to teach them if you could convince them, right? Because there there was a hurdle that you had to overcome. There was a few barriers there, and it's it. I think it looks really daunting to your average person, and that's why running, I think, was just an easy sell because. Anybody could just get up and start moving. And same thing with aerobics was you don't you don't need to uh, really master a lot of technique like you do with resistance training. But it's not as complicated as is being uh, promoted. And the stigma that kind of uh, has followed that has been to our detriment. As trainers. absolutely, well, look, okay, even the clients that we got that approached us, they still don't make up the majority of people that decide that they need to start exercising to right. improve their health. Right. The I think of people like, you know, my aunts or well, no, my mom. Literally yeah. yesterday, okay. So literally yesterday, my my brother in law, his girl, his girlfriend just bought the book. She also, like a week ago, purchased Maps Anabolic, and she also listened to her first Mind Pump episode, and it was the the woman, the uh, Fitness Woman's Forty One that we mm -hmm. just recently did, which covers I know a lot of points that we're talking about. Now, this was her, now, and mind you, she's part of our family. She hears me talk. She's around us all the time. So you just assume that the, the everyone's connected to me should know all this stuff. It's not true at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, what she said to me was, she goes, it was so crazy, Adam, because this, this is us talking literally yesterday. She goes, it's so crazy. I was following Maps Anabolic this last week, and she goes, and I was, the whole time I was questioning it. Why am I doing this? I, this is like nothing. This is not how I would normally train. Mm -hmm. I hope this works. Why am I resting so long? Yeah, and then she then she listened to the episode, and she's like, and all of a sudden she had this epiphany. It all it all came together for her. She's like, oh my god, I had no idea. I'm so glad I listened to the episode, and then that's what's also what well, triggered well, me by the book. Uh, pop culture and media plays a huge role in this. If you think of all the movies that we grew up watching in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and even today, whenever they portray a fit woman. Uh, how do they portray her working out? It's never resistance training. It's mm. never with weights. It's always some form of cardiovascular training yeah. or, or yoga, yoga, yeah, yoga yeah. or something. It's, it's it's like it's almost like, and they've done such a disservice again, Just especially to women. They have they have drawn a line and said these are feminine ways of exercising, and these are masculine ways yeah. of exercising. Now, even with men. There's a stereotype because even if you get the average guy who says, you know, he goes to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, you know, John, your blood pressure is a little high. You need to start exercising. He's like, oh, okay, I'm going to start working out. I'm going to go get on a stationary bike or I'm going to go walk on the treadmill. And then you talk to him. Let's say he's your uncle and you say, hey, why aren't you lifting weights? Oh, I don't, I don't need to. I'm not trying to get big. Doctor just says I need to drop my blood pressure and lose a little bit of weight. It's such a massive uh, it, it's such a huge stereotype problem, and, and it, it, it's an issue because it is preventing people from really improving their health in the most effective way possible, especially, and here's the kicker, it's when you consider the context of modern life. This is why, uh, this is why resist, one of the reasons why resistance training is the form of exercise everybody should pick, because if you look at modern life, there's a few characteristics that surround it that make it modern life. One of them is we're extremely busy. 
Okay? We're very, very busy. Our days are packed with more shit than ever before. Uh, work and got to drive my kid here, got to bring him there, got this schedule, got this doctor appointment, we got dinner, then we go to bed. And it, it, this is true now. If you look at people today versus people 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we're just busier in our schedules. Kids even, for example, they talk about how kids don't have a lot of free time anymore. Everything's scheduled for them. So we're very, very busy, but we're also simultaneously extremely sedentary. Life has been made very physically easy for us. The markets have done a good job of taking the physical out of everything. So, and we know this, the average person takes what? How many steps a day, Adam? It's like 2,000 or something yeah, like that? Yeah, it's less than 3,000. Less than 3,000, which is like a what? A 30 minute, or 40 minute walk, yeah, if right? Not, well, that's crazy. There's like 30, one 30 minute walk and you'll reach all the steps someone does typically an entire day. So you're busy as hell. You're very sedentary, but there's more. There's more to this. You also have, you are surrounded by very inexpensive, very easily accessible, heavily processed, hyper palatable food. So now we got all this food that's around us that's really easy to eat, where if I want to eat something, it takes me five minutes, I can order it to my door and I can have Chinese food or Mexican food or cookies or whatever I want. So you've got those things in combination. What do they, what do they end up producing? Well, they end up producing... A, a body that has very little muscle. We know muscle loss is 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 terrible these days. Uh, osteopenia is at all time highs, especially for women. This is bone loss. Women in their 30s and 40s are showing up with with bone loss. Men have way less strength today than they did uh, before. Lots of food, so we have lots of obesity on top of it. So what you want is you want a form of exercise that counters those things. Mm -hmm. But here's the kicker: it can't take a lot of time. And this is the problem with other forms of exercise. Other forms of exercise approach this problem by making you burn a lot of calories while you do this activity. But you can't do exercise, you know, an hour or two hours or three hours every single day when your schedule's super packed. So what we need is a form of exercise that takes less time, but that also teaches our body to burn more calories and counters bone loss, muscle loss, loss of mobility. By the way, the vast majority of injuries and pain that people experience today is a result of inactivity, loss of strength. Yeah. It's not the result of injury. In fact, kids now go to the doctor because of back pain. And it's not because they're lifting heavy things. Yeah. It's because they're sitting down all day long. Yeah. I wanted to ask you too, as you're going through this process and writing the book, I know there's a few studies that came out that even like proved how uh, muscle tissue was protective and it had all these like health qualities to it uh, besides, you know, obviously the, the, the strength and, and all these like, you know, performance characteristics. Yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll go over some that I think people get shocked by, right? There was, a, there was some studies done comparing cardiovascular activity, so like your traditional running, swimming, biking, whatever, to resistance training on fat loss. Now, we've seen other studies that show that resistance training is more effective for fat loss, mainly because it doesn't cause you to lose muscle. If anything, it, it causes you to build muscle in the long term, resulting in more fat loss. But what this study, what they did is they looked at the fat around the organs and the heart. And they found that resistance training was superior for burning body fat around the organs. This visceral body fat has uh, can cause big problems. This is, this is the kind of fat that causes health issues. Here's another one. This is a big one now. I, this just came out. I just Someone just sent this to me. They did a meta-analysis on resistance training versus stretching mm. for flexibility. Mm -hmm. Which one is going to be better for flexibility? Guess which one wins? Proper resistance training. Oh, wow. Now, that's yeah. that's counter to the stereotype. Again, what's the stereotype? Speaks to the central nervous system. It does. What's the stereotype of resistance training, yeah. lifting weights? Yeah, tight, it, shortened muscles. It doesn't make you uh, more flexible. If anything, it makes you tighter. Not true. Full range of motion, resistance training, improved flexibility, better than stretching because what you get with resistance training is you get functional flexibility. So although stretching may make may get you to the point where you can sit down in a full squat, only resistance training will give you strength so you can handle load in a full squat, for example. And what causes injury? It's uh, mobility issues, which comes from a combination of either tightness, looseness, but it's always lack of strength. Mm -hmm. Always lack of strength. Now, when, when you look back after doing all this, right, after writing it, and uh, assess your book in comparison to – our peers, right? We have a lot of friends that wrote books in the space. Yeah. And there's a, there's tons of fitness books out there. 
what is it that you think is so unique and different about what you wrote versus what, you know, say one of our buddies like Mike has written for, you know, uh, the, his book? Like what's so different about, you know, your book in comparison to all the other fitness books that are out there? Well, it's it's how I talk about um, resistance training, how I talk about exercise. By the way, the, we, in the book, I talk a lot about a lot more about other things as well. I talk about nutrition, how to approach that uh, in, a, in an effective way. How to have a you know produce a good relationship with food, um, how to get yourself to the point where this is a this is long term and not just short term things that we've talked about on the show in the past like you know exercising and eating right because you love yourself not because you hate yourself uh, why motivation is not something you should rely on I talk about all these things in the book but the main difference is I am trying to talk to I am not trying to talk to the fitness fanatic mm. I'm not trying to talk to the fitness enthusiast. I'm trying to reach the unreachable person. This is a very difficult task. Um, I'm trying to reach the person who would never consider resistance training at all. Those people who, you know, we've for years tried to reach and tried to get to to do these things. So that's what I was fishing for because I feel like, you know, we've all read a lot of the fitness books that are out there. And again, we have a lot of friends and peers that have them. And I feel like a majority of them are speaking to fitness fanatics already absolutely yeah. people oh, that are already in the gym yeah i mean they really get into the science of, of the macros and 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 like strength training and periodization and like you know really get into a high level uh, and i i think that appeals to other coaches and trainers and other mm -hmm. real fitness fanatic people that are already in it and are looking for the next level of education and i know when you went after doing this that's not who you that were wasn't your demographic. Yeah, you were like no. that's not I, that's the people I had in mind were uh, people everyday average people. the the majority the vast majority of the people who are suffering um, health problems uh, due to modern life right now. The obesity epidemic, right? The diabetes epidemic, um, the the osteoporosis epidemic. Uh, all these, you know, uh, basically all these. Terrible health issues that are that are resulting from uh, the way we live now in modern life the, is the majority. It's, it's everyday average people who don't know the difference between a, a a barbell lunge and a good morning. Probably don't even know what, what, what if I said that to them, they probably wouldn't know what those exercises are. Right. Those are the people that I'm trying to reach with this book. I'm also trying to reach fitness fanatics and health enthusiasts who this is my experience. This is also your experience. I'm a fitness fanatic. I'm a health enthusiast. Do you know how long I've been trying to talk yeah. family members into exercising <laughs> yes. the right way? What if there was a what if there was a book? What if there was something that I could give them that does a really good job of it? It and simplifies so, everything. Yes. And, and just like is really direct. Here's the nuts and bolts of what you need to do. Yeah, like, hey, check out this book. It's a health book. You know, see 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 how you feel about it. Or as a health enthusiast or fitness uh, person myself, or even as a personal trainer. I wanted this book to be able to uh, give ammunition to trainers and fitness enthusiasts so that they could read this. Because here's, here's the thing that you learn as a personal trainer. I mean, we must have said this a million times on the podcast. What makes you effective as a coach or a trainer is less of the knowledge that you have. It's more of how you communicate that knowledge. Can you get that person to really understand and take in what you're saying and apply it. It's very, very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. uh, if anybody who's a trainer who's listening knows exactly what I'm talking about. You could you could speak information till the cows come home. The person's not going to do it or doesn't really believe it. Um, you're wasting your time. So how you communicate is super, super important. And so I also wanted this book to be able to, to give people better tools of communication so that the trainer could read this book and say, okay, I see how he said that. This is how I'm going to talk to my clients to get them to make these decisions, you know, for themselves. Yeah. And I think it's just helpful for anything. Any, anytime you're trying to sell somebody on something, you want to be able to pre present as much value as possible. And, and I think this is another one of those things. Like if, if that's a concern of yours is to get one of your family members or somebody involved in an exercise program or something that's effective, you need to be able to like provide good points and things that resonate to them. And it doesn't happen right away. So this is another one of those things that, that creates an opportunity for another conversation where they can understand it a bit further and then actually like own into it. Well, I, I just wish, I wish, you know, and, and again, this is my wish, right? For the book. It's like, I wish people knew that because I train, I, we all train a lot of people, everyday average people, the people that we're talking about right now. Most of them, I'm not going to lie, most of them worked out twice a week. That's it. 
they worked out with me once a week and once on their own, or they worked out with me twice a week. It was two days a week. So I wish most people understood that you could just work out. Not that the, you, you couldn't do more. More would be great as well. But let's be honest. The average person, as we know, is not going to devote d- any time to daily structured exercise. It's just not going to happen. I wish most people knew that they could work out a couple days a week and reap tremendous benefits from a form of exercise that they probably didn't even consider. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's really quite ambitious of you. Mm. To try and <laughs> to attempt to well, do if you're this. Do well, it, somebody needs to do it. Right? I know. I just it's it's. I don't know if it, the audience even realizes how difficult this is going to be, right? Because you're not tar- Everybody else in the space targets the the twenty percent of the population that's already into. Fitness. They're the easy. It's the, the yeah. You know, yeah. They're there. They're already consumers. Of shooting it. fish in a, what yeah, in a any, any sales and marketing guy will tell you that it's always easier to sell to somebody who's already bought something already from you versus going out and getting a cold lead and converting. It's really going to take all the coaches and trainers and people that listen to us getting this for their clients, getting this for their family members and their friends, and really helping push it out into the mainstream people because that's who you're targeting. You're really yeah. going it after It needs a movement behind it. Yeah, and 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 hoping that they're going to walk through Barnes & Noble or scour Amazon and and find a book and, and then start reading it is really, really tough. No, mm-hmm. the, really the idea is that this book opens doors for me to get on uh, other platforms. Um, my that are more general population. Yeah, so like, so, exactly. Right. So my my favorite form of communication is obviously talking, right? Um, if I can get on, if I can get in front of people and talk about this book and talk about uh, resistance training, I feel confident I'll get enough people to be interested enough to grab it and read it, and I think that'll be the most effective way uh, to make this impact along with the fact that we have a huge audience of trainers and fitness enthusiasts who've been listening to us for a long time. And here's the deal. Uh, trainers have the biggest impact on the health of anybody uh, in the world. I was a trainer. I know this. There's nobody that'll, there's nobody that'll change a life in terms of their, their health more uh, effectively than a good personal trainer. Not even what we do on the podcast comes close. I mean, you, a good trainer who has 10 clients and they do a good job with those cl- 10 clients will fundamentally change those people's lives mm-hmm. in very, very big uh, lifelong ways. And if those people can get this book and give it to their clients and the clients can give it to other people. Um, I think that's uh, another part of the strategy that can be effective. Now, selfishly, I want to hear your experience of writing the book and everything from negotiating the money yeah. for it. I want to hear about uh, what that was like because I know that took some time. I know you had to hire somebody to help yeah. help with that. There's a lot of legal stuff that was involved. I want to know what it was like to sit down and like get in the mindset to write it, the time it took, like what, like, tell me all about that. Well, so the publisher Hachette approached us um, and, you know, they said that, you know, they want to work with us to put together a book. And um, you know, we have talked about, you know, me writing a book for a long time. I've just never written anything that long in my entire life. I've written all of our guides and I wrote, I write blogs, but a book is a completely uh, different animal. So they approach us and I said, you know what? Absolutely. I have, there's something I would like to write about. Um, but I, I did not know the space at all. So, okay. When they approach you, they didn't have a, we want you to write about this. They just said, they, they reached out and said, what would you like to write about? Okay. So you had that kind of, you know, so I basically pitched this idea to them. Yeah. That was one of the, that was one of the first conversations. And I got on the phone with their, their, one of their editors and, you know, part of their marketing team. And um, I sold it to them, and they loved it. They loved the idea. Uh, then the next step was negotiating, you know, pay and all that stuff. And that's when I got the agent because I have there's so much. This is a whole new world that I don't know what's good, what's not good. I don't know what to negotiate. So yeah. Uh, and when he talked to you, did he share with you like what's reasonable? Because it's your a first book deal, right? So it's not mm-hmm. like you're have, Stephen King. You I know what I'm saying? Idea, like, no. right? <laughs> so you, yeah. So did he like talk to you about that? Like, hey, this is good. This is not good. Or the, the agent did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The agent was really good, right? So uh, Rick is his name. Really, really good. And he was just he was. A, I know he was, he's a pain in their ass because he constantly is going back and saying, no, we want this, we want that, and. I would ask him, you know, I, anyway, I got to the point where I trusted him so much that I would say, if you think it's good, then, then, then we'll do it. Um, because he was that, he was that in depth with everything that he was representing. So that was an important part of the process. Another part of the process was working with someone to help with the writing of the book, because I've never written 
something this long and put something together like this before in my entire life. Which is interesting to me because you write all of our content. So all the, the, the eBooks and the things that we have out there, you're the one who rips all that. You don't have a ghost writer doing any of that stuff. So I thought it was interesting that you had a ghostwriter that helped write this. Yeah. They, they didn't write the book for you. You still wrote. No, it's my words. It's all my words. And so what we would do is we would, I would write, I would give it to her, or we would have conversations. She would write, send it to me. What do you think? We go through through things together. Um, it, it Doing it on my own would have taken a lot of time. Uh, and obviously we still have the show. We still have Mind Pop. I have kids. And again, I've never done anything like this before. Yeah, what parts of that would, did you see the most value in her? Like, would you do something and you would like, oh, this is really good. And then she would, you give it to her and then you would get it back and be like, oh shit, yeah. it's even better. And then or here's, what? Yeah, and then here's what's really cool is that because we have so many podcasts and we already have so much written content anyway, she mm. would go through and read my blog she and read your flavor, read my guides. Mm -hmm. And then she put things together. She'd send them to me and then I'd change them and tweak them. And she did a good job of capturing my voice. I mean, mm. it is my, those are my words and my voice in the book. So that was another part of the whole process. Was there anything in particular that stood out about having her that was like really amazing or awesome that really helped, whatever? Well, she's written uh, fitness books in the past and she's also a fitness fanatic. So it was really cool was having her go through, listen to the podcast or read some of the stuff I wrote or us discuss what we're going to put in the book and her coming back and getting her and basically telling me her mind was blown. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So she's like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Or wow, this like makes so new much sense. information for yeah, me. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I've been doing this wrong or whatever. And in fact, she started following our programs because it, oh, that's it, so it made great. such a positive that's impact. That's so cool. And it, it obviously, of course, makes me feel good because she's, you know, she's done this for a long time and she was being quite, quite genuine. So that was the first bit of feedback, in fact, was from her. But of course, she's working for me. So part of me is like, is she saying this? Is she is stroking she my ego? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm paying her. Is she just <laughs> yeah, <laughs> making she me just, feel good? <laughs> yeah. The, the next bit of feedback I got was when we had the first like kind of edit put together or whatever. And I sent it to my aunts who never lift weights, right? They never, they know I work out. They know the whole thing, but they, they don't, they don't do any of that stuff. So I sent them all copies and they'd read it because I'm their nephew or whatever. And then I just didn't say anything. We'll see what happened. And then I started getting questions from them like, hey, I want to start lifting weights. Uh, do you think this is a good schedule? Which one of your programs should I follow? So I'm like, okay, this is good. Yeah. It's it's kind of working a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Got some great feedback from the guy who works for the uh, uh, the publishing company for when I did the audio version. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a whole nother thing, right? They said, we want to do, we're going to do an audio version. Do you want to be the voice uh, reading the book? I'm like, well, I, can't, I have to be, I have a podcast. Yeah. It would be weird for someone who listens to the show to buy the book and then hear some like British dude <laughs> you know, yeah. reading read the book. So you know? what was his what was his title? Because he does this with other books, right? Yeah. He's in there to sit in and make sure like you're pronouncing words correctly and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting, right? So the schedule was I come in here. Uh, actually, I was supposed to go to a – they have a recording studio that you go to and they rent them or whatever, and you go in and do your whole thing. But Doug's like, fuck that. We got the shit over yeah. here. Yeah. I'm like, we <laughs> have a lockdown. I'm like, we have a professional. We have a Doug. Yeah. We have a yeah. professional podcast. Like, can I do it in my studio so I don't have to go somewhere? So then they had Doug send in some audio. And I think, Doug, you sent in audio of nothing, right? You just hit the recorder and because they wanted to hear the background. Right, yeah. They wanted your voice, and they also wanted nothing in the background. And, and then what they do, they told you what, I don't even know what the hell they have. Well, yeah, there's a couple things. So our studio is good, but it's not perfect. Uh, one of the things that is with you is that your voice projects a lot. And right now you're sitting in such a space that your voice bounces off the back wall, which is the green screen. So we put you in Justin's chair so that he had foam across the yeah. way from you to help Re, you know, minimize reflections. That must have helped you quite a bit. We took yeah. your mouth away from the microphone too. So right now with the podcast, everybody's really up on their mic. So I don't have to turn up what's called the gain so much mm. and get a lot of cross talk on the microphones. We put you back about 12 inches from the microphone to minimize the, the P sounds and that type of thing. So it was a little bit different process than what we use for the podcast. Yeah. So now were they in, were they in, happy or impressed with the sound or were they like oh we would rather well they approved it, it. Okay. they approved it I haven't heard anything back from them which is actually a good sign yeah so and then the, the the schedule was I was to come in here we would get on like a Zoom with the person from the publishing company and what they do is they listen in and then they'll stop me 
and say something like, hey, can you uh, say this more emphatically? Or can you, uh, you know, it sounded like a, you ended this sentence in a question, but we want it to be more of a statement or mm. now I had pronounce to, this wrong. I had to do this with Doug a little bit. And that was really hard for me to do. Is that Did that come natural for you? You know, I was nervous. I was nervous going into it because it was uh, three days, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. with a break for lunch for 30 minutes. So I had to sit in the chair and read from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. out loud, mm -hmm. which I'm like, I don't know if my my attention can handle that. I don't know if my brain can handle just, just doing that. So I was nervous. I'd never done anything like that before. Right. So I started it. He gets on. Great, super nice dude. And, uh, I mean, he gave great feedback. First, he said he said that I did a great job. So he said, you did, you're doing a very good, good job, better than most people, which I thought was awesome. And then as I was going, here's the best part, uh, feedback I got for the book. As I was going, he's not even – you know, he's not somebody I gave the book to. He's just listening because he's listening to me read it, right? As we're going along and every once in a while we pause, he's like, oh man, I'm sending this book to my friends. Oh wow, when you said this, what did you mean? Oh, this is awesome. I can't believe I've been doing this wrong or whatever. That's so he was cool. super into it after we were done. And then afterwards he's like, I'm going to make sure that they get you to do another book. This is this is exceptional. This is the kind of book that we need to get it, get out there. Oh wow. Yeah, so I was like Ooh. really, really hyped oh, that's cool. about that afterwards. Damn, that's yeah. how, dude, you're way better than I am. I didn't even, I had to do like a paragraph, right, for we, our marketing stuff. And Doug would, Adam, you need to be more more, more lively or more, more <laughs> depressed, more sad. I'm like, I'm like, I don't know how to fucking do that. You know what I'm saying? I'm just, I'm reading these words. That, that half of them are mine, half of them are not, and trying to do that, I struggled a lot with that. That's not easy. No, uh, it's not. It, uh, but and I don't. It's not something I would ever want to do, like for a living. Hell no. That yeah. took a lot of energy, dude. After I was done, I got home and I remember I was just like, "What? Yeah. What would you say? What's my motivation? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what would you say was the most difficult part of the entire process? Ooh, you know, easily it's, you know, it's interesting when we first started the podcast. And we would put out episodes. I remember there was an initial kind of feeling of like, oh my God, it's out there. What we said is out there, right? People are going to hear what I'm saying. And you'd get a little bit, like I'd get like a tiny bit nervous, but then I was like, eh, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Because nobody had expectations. It was all new. Because uh, we're established and because I'm representing the team, there's much more expectations. Believe it or not, the hardest part was my own psyche. The oh. hardest part is... Okay, am I going to do a good job? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, are we going to? Is it going to? You know, perform? Am I going to represent the team properly? Like that was the hardest yeah, part of the whole thing. You're just putting a lot of pressure on yourself. Totally, and, very different from anything I've ever. And was that like the whole process? You were like that, or was it just the beginning to get you started? You were like hung up on that, or did, were you constantly kind of questioning? Every step yeah. was like that. Every single step. Oh wow. And yeah. So I'd say that that was all probably the hardest. The writing it was was fun. You know, it's I'm talking about things I've been talking about for forever, so uh, it's easy for me to 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 get it out and to get it out in a way that um, I'd want it on paper. You know, it's like it's funny. You look back at your at your life and then you realize all the things that you did to prepare you for whatever moment you're in at the moment. And communicating to clients, and I, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Like training people for that long you really figure out how to say what you need to say in a way that gets people that gets it to resonate that's really what you figure out as a trainer more than anything well if you don't you're not successful yeah. you, you can't yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying if you've been a trainer for 10 10 or more years you've lasted that long because you care about people you, no way a trainer would last longer than a couple years if you care about people the kind of the job is just you're dealing with different personalities nobody wants to listen to what you're saying you fail a lot in the beginning. If you don't really love helping people, you're not going to last as a personal trainer. So if you've been training for 10 years, it's because you love helping people. And because you love helping people, you're constantly evaluating how effective mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. Am I really getting people in shape? Why is it that people lose weight and then when they stop working out with me, they gain the weight back? You know, I really want these people to have long lasting yeah. results. I, what other angle can I present this where it's going to resonate? Yeah, these meal plans I'm giving people, they fail every single time. Why aren't they doing what I'm saying? Or this crazy calorie burning workout that I'm doing where I'm having people jump rope and jump over benches and, you know, do all this stuff is why are people dropping off? Why aren't people improving their health? Like, you got to keep examining. Why is it that people won't change their diet? I'm telling them what not to eat. They just yeah. don't want to listen to me. It's you simple. go through this whole process. And so eventually you really figure out how to communicate in a way that gets people there. And so, you know, writing this book was just literally a, a culmination of just all that. Now, I'm also curious about, and how much, I don't know how much of this you know, um, 
but obviously a, a big goal would be to make this a bestseller, right? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, that would be awesome. And I know there's like a certain time frame. There's certain rules. Like we we can't go take a bunch of our money and go buy a hundred thousand yeah. books ourselves and then get make you a, a bus. A Which people have done right. Yeah. So that they have things in place. They now have protections against. Yeah, them, by they, the way. they do. Mm-hmm. So you can't. It, that doesn't help you. So, but I do know that. There's a lot of people, one, that listen to the show and that would love to support any way they can. I've got a ton of family, both on Katrina's side and my side, that I'm kind of rallying right now together mm-hmm. to try and help and support this so we can get this thing out there and make it a bestseller. Yeah. What are the best things that I can do or we can do to try and boost those numbers and get as much momentum as we can? You know, I'd say, you know, uh, obviously get yourself a copy and get some copies for your friends and then in, conv- and talk to people about doing the same. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the book itself is going to have to deliver, right? People are going to have to read it and it's either going to make an impact or it's not. It's either going to fall in that discount bin at the Barnes and Noble of all the other fitness and health books that you see in that, you know, I, every time I go to, to a bookstore, I love bookstores. I, I, I treat them like libraries. I go in there and read, I almost never buy anything. But when I go in there, I always visit the fitness and health section and you see that the, the the way books keep recycling through there and how many of them don't make much of an impact. And mm-hmm. then to make matters worse, the ones that do tend to become bestsellers are terrible. They're, they're gimmicks, they're fads, they're weird diets. Mm-hmm. And so it's either going to make an impact and it's going to change how people view resistance training and exercise and health in general, or it's not. And if it does, then I think it's going to do it in a big way. I think you should do a, a Justin Timberlake move. What's that? You don't know that is? No. So you, when it gets out in Barnes & Noble, I think that you should go randomly, okay, but a little t- spin. Like he, what he did was he'd show up at a Barnes & Noble, he'd go in and he'd sign seven copies uh-huh. and then he would tell everybody on his social media where he's at. You should do the same thing but like a nude photo of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so you should show up at random- Nobody at, wants yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> show up at random Barnes & Noble. we're going to bleach his hair and like perm it or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Slide some nudes in there, tell everybody where it's at, yeah. and then see how many books we could sell. Hey, I bought this fitness book. <laughs> some old guy put a yeah. <laughs> some old guy put a naked picture of himself in there. Lady, <laughs> yeah, what the hell's going on? <laughs> this, yeah. No, I'm not going to do gentlemen. that. I'm not going to do that at all. Well, no. maybe sign then. Okay, you yeah. can sign some books. Yeah. I think that's a cool do people idea. People still do that. Do they still sign books? Yeah, sort of, of course they do. Okay. Silly. Yeah, no, he, he just did that. Like uh, I think that happened last year or whenever he released his latest book, and I thought that was really clever. I was like, oh, that's cool, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you were already a big fan, you already planned to buy it, and then you. You see, like, oh shit, he's in my town, and yeah. he went signed seven. You're like, you're rushing down yeah. there right away. I just, you know, I just have this dream that that, and I think it's coming. To be honest with you, I think it's coming anyway. I think whether this book does well or not, I think it's happening anyway because the studies are becoming overwhelming. The, the evidence is just huge. And the culture is shifting. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I think it's going to happen oh, anyway. We, to where- we've seen this in in just our yeah. two decades. Mm-hmm. I mean, we talk about this on the show all the time that. You know, and it's not an exaggeration when we say that nobody even used a squat rack. No. I mean, yeah. none of my trainers. I didn't. I no mm-hmm. nobody did. Members didn't. It just collected dust. One one guy a week used it, maybe. You know you, what I'm saying? You know, I remember too when I when I ended my career as a trainer, a lot of my clients at that point were were doctors. I used to my studio was next to a hospital. I had a lot of surgeons, vascular surgeons, general surgeons, I had a lot of anesthesiologists and uh, hormone doctors. And, you know, because I, once I trained one, they referred their friends and they all came to me. And then they started referring their patients. And they were always so, and this just highlights what I'm talking about. They were always so blown away by the, the health improvements of themselves and their patients through resistance training. They used to tell me that, like, you know, um, I'm sending you this patient that I have who has uh, high blood pressure. Um, and I never would have normally recommended resistance training. But I've seen what you've done with me. I'd like to see what you can do with them. And then within a few months, I'm getting a report from them. They're like, I can't believe what's happening with with my patient that I sent you. This is blowing me away. And they would just continue to refer people to me. Um, And I have this, uh, again, I have this dream, and I think it's happening anyway, but I do have this dream that at some point, you know, modern medicine, when they recommend you go exercise, they say, we want you to go do resistance strength, which, by the way, can be performed with your body, can be performed with bands. Of course, you can use weights or machines. By the way, in the book, I put workouts in there as well. I actually put programs in there. Mm-hmm. So there's a program that is uh, with just bands. There's a program in there with just dumbbells. And then I put a full gym, you know, full home gym uh, program in there. And so that's really my dream. My dream is that. And, you know, uh, it's 
extreme resistance training is extremely customizable. This is, this is what makes me upset about modern medicine. They know this. If you get physical therapy for an injury or a problem, physical therapists do resistance training with you. That's what they do. They don't mm -hmm. do other forms of exercise mm -hmm. because they know why, because you can customize it to the individual like no other form of exercise that exists. I can't do that with any other form of exercise, yeah. but resistance training. Um, so my dream is that it becomes the form of exercise that's recommended. And it's, my dream is that it's, it's when, when, you know, ladies are, are hanging out with each other for, you know, Sunday fun day. And they're like, Hey, we all need to start working out. And instead of saying, let's, go let, for a run. let's all go for a run, they all say, or join that class. I got some dumbbells. Let's go lift some weights. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's my dream. So look, mind pump is recorded on video as well as audio. So you can find us on YouTube. We also have a lot of free guides that you can find at mindpumpfree.com. And then finally, you can pre-order this book right now. It's called The Resistance Training Revolution. There's some cool offers going on right now because it's pre-order. Go to theresistancetrainingrevolution.com. Again, that's theresistancetrainingrevolution.com. Running gyms for as long as I did, most people, a lot of people don't follow programs. What would you call Mondays in the gym? International what? Chest day. Chest day, right? Yeah. All the benches were taken. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, everybody's doing the bench press. And of course, the squat rack back in those days had yes. dust all over it. Nobody was using it. So it makes a big difference to follow a program just simply to prevent you from neglecting.